to a grade level that has not taught Eureka, or you were one of the fifth grade teachers who did not get the training because you were departmentalizing and no longer are. We do have a few teachers. We have about three left that are still departmentalizing in our district, but they are receiving the training today because that will not be the case next year. So they're trying to get all trained up. We are so thrilled that everyone is here today. And we want to remind you of the cross district virtual norms that apply for this session today. Those norms would be that we stay muted unless we are speaking in our breakout rooms or are speaking to the presenter. Um, otherwise, then we remute ourselves and all screens should be on. This is not a sit and get type presentation. This is a participatory as if we were all in the same room together and we wouldn't hide behind a, a binder or a computer screen there either. So make sure that your screen is on and your attention is on our presenters. We normally um, do this presentation in six hours live with a one hour lunch. Instead, we are doing it four hours virtually and then you will take a lunch break after that before your afternoon meetings begin. Please do have questions and if so, drop them into the chat as I'm sure Ms. McGuire will explain in just a moment. But we are honored and pleased to have our presenters today from Great Minds, Eureka Math. Um, and if there are no questions for me, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Ms. McGuire and I'm gonna wish you all a wonderful morning of training. Any questions? Perfect. Good morning, Q. Thank you. All right. Well, if you do have questions, you can still put them in the chat. We'll be sure to answer them or pass them along. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. So as she mentioned, mentioned, my name is Lauren McGuire. Feel free to just call me Lauren. Um, I'm coming to you from the Chicago area where I currently serve as the math achievement director for my district of schools. Uh, this year in particular, I am helping our teachers to implement the Eureka curriculum K through eight. Uh, before I I served in this role, I actually taught the Eureka curriculum for over five years as a fifth grade math teacher. Uh, fifth grade is my one true love. Um, and then I worked as a math interventionist, so supporting all types of learners across multiple grade levels. Um, I consider myself a glorified math nerd. I own that proudly. I love teaching math. I love talking about math. And I love being around math teachers. So it is really, really exciting and such an honor to be here with you. Uh, joining me is Seal, um, and I'm going to pass it off to her to introduce herself. Uh, good morning. That is Seal. That's short for Lucille, and I am in sunny Panama City, Florida, um, where right now the sun is shining, but it will be raining later. Um, I just recently, um, this past school year, retired after many, many years in education. And yes, that was already planned before the pandemic. Um, the first 20 years, I was a high school and middle school math teacher. Then I served our district as a K-12 math instructional specialist. And that's where I fell in love with elementary math. And Lauren and I are soulmates and that we are both math nerds. And I love fifth grade math as well. Um, the, my last year, um, knowing that it was going to be my last year, I resigned that position and became a Title I K-5 math resource teacher so I could be in every single grade level for um, elementary. And it was the best year ever um, until March 13th. But we um, started Eureka Math four years ago and uh, I fell in love with math even more when I saw how beautifully written math, the story of math is. Um, through the story of units. So glad to be with you here today. Thanks so much. She is going to be manning the chat. So if you have questions, this is your time to make sure that you are set up for success as you implement Eureka. So put the questions in the chat. Um, she'll either flag them for me or try to answer them um, herself. Uh, but again, do not let questions go unanswered. This is your time. Um, 
Elizabeth mentioned a little bit about the norms, but I just want to emphasize that we are going to be doing some independent study where I'm going to ask you to read some things individually, reflect. Um, we're going to be doing some small group discussions through breakout rooms. And then I am going to be asking you to engage in some whole group discussions, either using the chat feature or just unmuting and sharing out with the whole group. Um, limiting those distractions as much as you possibly can. So avoid using your cell phone and email and lesson planning and all the good stuff. Um, I know that it is often hard to manage all the things that we have to get done in a day, but staying focused for the next couple hours is really going to help you take away everything you can. The Zoom toolbar is going to be your best friend. Um, as mentioned, please stay muted. This reduces background noise. The video, um, Elizabeth mentioned it is a norm. I'm also just selfish. I like to look at real faces and feel like I'm talking to real human educators. So just as much as possible, please keep those uh, cameras on. Uh, the participants tab, it's got two people and the number 26. If you click that, at the bottom is a second toolbar with the raise hand feature. So if you are feeling courageous and willing to share out during our whole group discussions, you're gonna use the raise hand feature. And then finally, the chat. You can use the chat in two different ways. So if you pull up in the chat window now, you're going to see a little blue box at the bottom. Blue box, if it says everyone, it's a whole group discussion. If you select a specific name like SEALs, you're going to be engaging in that private chat. So feel free to use it both ways. Let's get started with a brief reflection. So take 30 seconds and think back to a time when you have had an aha moment in mathematics, maybe as a student in your own educational career, or as a teacher, as you're working with students. So think of that aha moment. In just a moment, CEO is going to do this to dismiss you to your very first breakout room of the day. You're going to be in partners. I'd like for you to, you to discuss your aha moment with your partner, share back and forth. And then when we come back, I'm going to be looking for you to share out either your own aha moment or maybe that of your partners. You're going to have three total minutes to discuss in your breakout room. At the end of two, a little box is going to pop up in the middle of your screen saying you have 60 seconds left. Don't click the box, ignore the box, don't come back to the room, use the full 60 seconds to wrap up your conversation, and then Zoom will bring you back automatically to our whole group. Seal, whenever you're ready.
beautiful. It looks like we have everyone back. So using the participants tab, so if you click the number 25 at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, and the raise hand feature, if you are willing to share about your own aha moment or maybe your partner's. Christy, if you'll unmute, and then I'll, um, and then M. Gleason, and then Tyler. So, Christy, um, I actually was sharing to um, my aha moment was actually with Eureka last year. <laughs> in awesome. Year because I at first like could not stand it or wrap my head around how this was going to work at all, <laughs> but um, I did not give the kids enough credit. Um, they came in and they struggled a little at first because they're fifth graders, so there were some gaps, but. Um, they immediately started using the language and they were able to just catch on really quickly. So I think that was my aha moment of just like, hey, the kids can do more than we think they can. So, um, and I, I knew that. Like chills. Ooh, that's so good. <laughs> I knew that, but it was just something different. So it's just one of those things different is never comfortable, but they did great. So I would just say, don't... Um, don't knock it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that so much. Em Gleason, if you want to unmute and share out now. Good morning, everyone. My partner's math aha moment was more interesting than mine, so I'll share this. My partner <laughs> uh, was Nicole Prindle. Her and I both teach at Belvedere. And her math aha moment, she was a fifth grade science teacher last year, and she's now in first grade. So she did not teach math last year. So it's been a while. And she said that in remote learning, when it began this past spring, her son was in first grade and he is now in second grade, but she just worked with him one-on-one -on -one and showed him more of a visual way to represent his thinking. And he just, he said something like, I got it mom to her. And I think that was cool because she got to be both a mom and a teacher at the same time. So I'm sure that was uh, encouraging for her. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I love that. And then Taylor, would you like to unmute? I'll give you the final word. Um, my partner and I kind of talked about opening up students' way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Her aha moment was whenever she started doing math talks in her classroom. Um, my aha moment was whenever I started using Singapore math um, mm -hmm. and opening up students' way of thinking. So both of our aha moments kind of came in the way of opening up students' minds to solving problems different ways and um, being, uh, having more initiative whenever they're solving problems. So I thought that was pretty cool. Very cool. Hopefully you see a little bit of Singapore math foundationally in the curriculum. It, it, it is an influence, I would say, as well as that discussion piece that we'll get to a little bit later today. Thank you for sharing all of those. They were extremely thoughtful. So I'm excited to dig into this with you. Before we get into the actual math, let's talk about why it's called Eureka. So please take 30 seconds and read the slide you see on the screen. We in no way endorse running naked through the streets, but I really, really hope the joy of discovery that is evident in his proclamation is exactly the same experience for you and your students this year as you're embracing this Eureka curriculum, right? A couple of you mentioned this, that kids get it and we have to help them make sense of the thinking and knowledge that they already have. And that's hopefully what you're gonna see throughout the curriculum. So we're going to use this idea of Eureka and aha moments and pause a couple different times throughout our morning uh, to just reflect on new thinking or next steps for ourselves. You can use page three of your virtual engagement materials to record any thoughts. You can also pull up a Word document or just have any other note catcher on your um, table or whatever. 
But I do encourage you in those moments to write down things that you're thinking about. What are your next steps? How has your thinking been um, pushed and engaged uh, to, to be able to implement this curriculum effectively? We are going to be using those um, virtual engagement materials. So if you do not have them um, either digitally or printed out, please take 30 seconds and, and go ahead and grab those materials now. We're going to be using them at several different points throughout our session. So let's engage in some math thinking. We, in just a moment, are going to observe a video demonstration using linking cubes. And throughout the demonstration, we are trying to represent part-whole relationships. As the part-whole relationships are being demonstrated, I want you to zoom in specifically to the unit. How does the unit progress? And how does that progression support the part whole understanding that we're working to develop in our students. Okay, so part whole understanding, zoom into that unit and understand the coherence that is taking place. Let me make sure you can hear it. Show me a stick of 10 linking cubes with two colors. The different colors show two groups of five. With these five groups visible, we can use the two colors to show any number to 10. For example, we could show eight as five and three more. Let's use the cubes to model a math story. There are five cars parked in a row. Three more cars park next to them. How many cars are there now? There are eight cars. There are eight cars parked in a row. Five cars drive away. How many cars are left? There are three cars left. What does each cube represent in my story? Each cube represents one car. What two parts are designated in the story? Start with the larger part. The two parts in my story were five cars and three cars. What hole was designated in the story? There were eight cars total in my story. Now let's change the value of each cube or unit to one eighth. Show three copies of one eighth. What fraction of the whole are you showing? We are now showing three eighths of the whole. Show five more eighths than three eighths. Now we're showing five more eighths than three eighths. Show one whole. We know that all eight eighths are equal to one whole. Which two parts are designated in the story? Start with the larger part. The two parts are 5 eighths and 3 eighths. What whole was designated in the story? The whole is all 8 eighths. Let's change the value of each cube or unit to 4. Show all eight of your cubes. How many fours does this show? Our stick now shows eight fours. Break apart your cubes by color. What two parts did I break 
eight fours into. Now we can see five fours and three fours. What is the value of five fours? We can think of five fours as five times four, and that equals 20. What is the value of three fours? We can think of three fours as three times four, and that equals 12. What is the value of the whole? Since five fours is 20 and three fours is 12, we can add those two parts together. 20 plus 12 equals 32. Therefore, all eight fours have a value of eight times four, which also equals 32. So how did the use of the unit support the development of part whole thinking across the grades? How did the use of a unit support part whole thinking across the grades? When you have a thought, type it into the chat for us. Make sure it's said to everyone, sorry. Tammy, I really like what you said. It's easy to switch from holes to fractions. Can I actually ask you to unmute and elaborate? Why was it easy? Um, I just think that when you're speaking to the kiddos about um, that each block equals one, and now you're saying, okay, all of them together equal one, so what does each of the parts equal? It's easy for them to say, oh, I, I have eight, so one would equal an eighth, so. Yeah, absolutely, right? What I heard you say is that in both cases, right, the model stayed the same, and thinking about parts and holes stayed the same. That was an underlying concept, but what was changing was the unit. So kids didn't have to necessarily think about parts and holes. They could focus in on the unit and apply the concepts that they already knew from whole numbers to their fraction understanding. Beautiful. I also really love, um, I heard a couple people talk about the language, right? The language stayed consistent and how important that is. So working across the K through five progression. Um, the visual representation, um, using uh, the small chunks, right? So you're moving past keep, or counting by ones, but you're applying that same idea um, to more complex numbers. So the use of a unit cube is a very concrete model. You can pull them out at any time and have kids manipulate them throughout a lesson. I want to show a second uh, model that represents parts and holes that is frequently used in the curriculum, but is a little bit more pictorial, right? But the same idea of parts and holes is evident throughout. So the number bond. Let's zoom in to the first two number bonds. In both cases, I see that the whole is eight. So that's staying consistent in my number bond. I also see the parts are consistent. Five and three, five and three. If I look at those two number bonds, the only thing that is changing is the unit. The first number bond represents kindergarten. And so in kindergarten, we want to use cars, a real world unit that kids can see and they know. This helps them attach the math to something they already understand. As we progress to first grade, right, you see a much more complex unit introduced place value, tens, but they're able to take their understanding and apply it to a more complex unit. Please take one minute 
And I want you to continue to observe the number band bonds um, on the page. You can use page four of your virtual engagement materials if that's easier for you to see. I want you to be able to identify one connection of the number bonds. So take one minute to observe to identify one connection. There's many, but you just need to find one. All right, pull open the chat, set to everyone, and share one connection you noticed. Beautiful. So the numbers are staying the same. It's part, part, whole. The whole is always divided into parts. Beautiful. Nicole, you mentioned the whole is always at the top. I do want to emphasize that sometimes we do see the number one rotated, right? So sometimes it will be on the side. So just be prepared for that. Not sure why we don't represent that in this paper, but A couple other things I'd like for you to notice um, that I'm not seeing come through in the chat is one, the physical representation of the number bond changes about halfway through, right? You see that we're actually moving away from the circles and so we're using a less complex, right, way to separate it, but the, still the idea of breaking a whole into parts. The unit is also increasing in complexity. We go from cars and we end all the way with algebraic representations. And as we progress those units, the idea of parts and wholes does not change. So that is foundationally the purpose of the K through five progression. It is called a story of units based off of what we just explored, right? We want to be able to study one idea across the complexity of units. So let's dig a little bit deeper into what that actually means. A successful implementation of the Eureka curriculum is going to be enhanced by a basic understanding of the three key shifts that are evidenced in recent mathematical standards. So focus, coherence, and rigor. I am on page five of your virtual engagement materials, so please turn to page five now. There, you're gonna see a short professional read, and I'm going to give you three minutes to read through it about these three key shifts. As you read, please turn your cameras off. When you're finished reading as a signal to us, go ahead and turn your cameras back on. Three minutes, please read.
seeing a few cameras come back on, I'm going to give it just another minute for you to finish up. As you finish up, feel free to just join us uh, with your cameras back on. So the first shift you read about was focus. Effective math instruction relies on this focus of a few big ideas or topics, like the units or the part-whole relationships that we just explored um, in our two examples. When you as the teacher get to focus on fewer topics, students get to learn them deeply, right? They understand the concepts and the skills in a very, uh, with a lot of depth. This focus also provides opportunities to link across the topics, the same way we just saw happen. This linking is that second shift, which is coherence. I know before Eureka that I personally taught a lot of isolated lessons I had a list of standards for my state and it was a checklist. Done, 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 right? But the, uh, the writers of Eureka Math really consider this intentional sequencing of ideas across a grade level and across a grade band, right? Even a sequencing within the modules that we're about to look at. The third shift is rigor and we're gonna look deeply at that when we get to the lesson level of the curriculum. So these three shifts are going to help frame all of our study this morning. So please keep them in mind as I'm going to uh, refer back to them often. But right now, let's pause for those Eureka moments. So please pull up page three or whatever note catcher you have and jot down any thoughts or reflections you might have had up until this point, or maybe even a next step for yourself. So the first shift we read about was focus. And one way we see that focus is addressed is by looking at the overall structure of the curriculum. We are gonna dig into the components of a module as well as the lesson level through the remainder of our time together. And as we are digging into the materials, I want you to notice the focus. How does this focus allow you to teach and students to learn with greater depth? You're going to need two different resources as we jump to uh, this next section. First, page six of your virtual engagement materials. This is a note catcher with reflection questions about the module. So page six. You are also going to need a teacher edition or the module overview from your grade level. So you should have selected this beforehand. If not, please find a module overview from your grade level. I'm gonna pause for you to find both of those resources. They could be printed or digital, both work. So for our shared learning purposes today, I'm going to use a module overview from grade three. 
I know we're not all grade three teachers, but the structure of the curriculum is the same K through five. So this will just allow us to have that shared learning experience. If you have specific grade level questions though, feel free to ask them. Um, the image you see on your screen now is a table of contents from grade three, module one. Any time that you are about to teach a module, this is the first place that I want you to direct your attention because the table of contents provides a big picture overview. So at the table of contents, you can see a title at the top. So this will give you an idea of the focus of that particular module. You're gonna see that the module is broken into sections. Each one of those sections is called a topic or a mid-module or end-of-module assessment. The number of topics changes per unit, right? And is uh, derived from the content of that module. So you could see anywhere from four to seven or eight topics in a module. This particular one has six. When a module has four or fewer topics, so it's a little bit on the smaller side, you're only going to see an end of module assessment. All right. So you will not always see two assessments. If it's smaller, you're only going to see the end of module assessment. What I want you to take away from the table of contents and observe on your table of contents now is the sequencing of those topic titles. So how does the learning progress and stay focused in this particular module? Go ahead and look at your table of contents for that progression and focus now. The next place that I'm going to ask you to turn to in your module overview is called the uh, topics and lesson objectives chart. My example was on page six, so you're going to need to flip a few pages in, but please find the lesson objectives chart for your module now. What I want you to think of what just happened is we saw a big picture overview and then I'm pressing zoom in. So this lesson objective chart is greater detail of those topics that we just observed. So in this chart, you can see that each row coordinates to one of the topics that was outlined. And within each topic, I can see the grade level standards that are addressed. I can see how many lessons coordinate to that topic and the objectives of those lessons, as well as the number of days for suggested um, delivery. One of my favorite things about the curriculum is you can see that there's actually a place um, where they designate time for the assessment. So in this particular assessment, there's two days to administer as well as return and reteach from the assessment. So this is really helpful to have that time built in. It's also some flexibility, right? If you need to make some adjustments and reteach before those assessments. Again, at this place, I want you to notice the progression of the lesson objectives this time. How does it keep um, the learning focused on the main idea or the big topic, but also what is that sequence of learning for your students? So take one minute and read through the chart of your teacher overview.
I'm moving quickly because we've got a lot to get through. So uh, please make note of that and, and jump back to it if you need to. The next place I'm going to take you is the module overview. Mine is on page two, so I need to flip back towards the front. What I want you to think here is we press zoom in one more time. So we're getting even more detail about the story of math as it unfolds across the module. Two quick notes. When I first started teaching Eureka, I looked at this page and was like, nope, I don't got time to read all of that. And if I could give you one piece of advice, it would be take the time to read the module overview. This will help to build the content knowledge for you as a teacher. A quick tip that I have found and always recommend is put the module overview side by side with that lesson objectives chart we just looked at because you'll see the focus of each topic then and how the objectives of those lessons are really sequenced. I'm going to ask for you to take another minute and begin reading the lesson narrative for your module. I want you to make important note of models that it's representing, language that it's using, and strategies that it's emphasizing for how you will teach your students. You're not going to have a chance to read the whole thing, but get as much read as you can for the next minute. All right, I'm moving as quickly. But I want to point you to a few other pieces that are in the module overview that are really important for you to um, read through. The first is the page that identifies the focus grade level standards. I find it always important to go back to the standards and the language of the standards to make sure that you are addressing rigor in the appropriate way. There's also going to be a place that identifies the foundational standards. So what are the previous grade levels or where does the topic that you're studying originate from? There's a section called focus standards for mathematical practice. If you're not aware, the standards for mathematical practice is a set of second standards. They are not content standards, but they are literally practice standards. So how would I as a person engage with the mathematics or practice it um, as a professional? Um, so you can see like modeling with mathematics or reason abstractive, ab abstractly and quantitatively. What I really like about it is the Eureka writers were specific, right? Sometimes this can just be like overgeneralized and like some jargon. They actually are very specific about how students will engage with math in those particular ways. Um, so it's just very helpful to look through. Another place is familiar terms and symbols. So this is to make sure that you are prepared with vocabulary as well as models and math language that you're going to be using. There's also a place that says suggested tools um, and representations. So if you need to prepare uh, materials uh, for the unit, you can double check those. Um, I understand that you guys are in a virtual setting. Uh, Seal, do you have the link to the virtual manipulatives? Okay, so in the chat, 
um, Seal's going to drop the uh, virtual manipulatives uh, from Didex. Uh, Didex helps create all the Eureka aligned materials. Here's their virtual in case you need to use those for any of your lessons. The last place I want to take you in a module overview is the assessment summary. It's exactly how it sounds. It's going to identify the specific standards on each assessment, when to deliver the assessment, as well as the rubric and how it, um, how it should be assessed. Uh, one note about the assessments is that they are not often progressive. So it sounds like it is because it says mid-module and then end of module, but oftentimes they're addressing different standards, right? They certainly build off each other, but they could be two very different assessments. And so just ensuring that you're aware of what's on both and, and when to really target specific standards throughout the module. What questions can I answer about the module overview at this point? If there are no questions, I will keep moving. If they come up, put them in the chat. See, it will be all over it. She did put the link to virtual manipulatives in the chat. So if you have not had a chance, please pull open your chat. Click that link, bookmark that page. They are very, very useful. She is now going to put a link in the chat to a discussion board tool we're going to use called Nearpod. I'm going to ask for you to click into um, that tool. You're going to be asked to enter your first name when you get there. So please enter your first name. And then you're going to see a question for reflection at the top. What I'm going to ask for you to reflect on and share with your colleagues is how do you see yourself using this module overview as you're preparing to teach? So how would you use this resource to help support your delivery? I see about six of us in there. So again, she put the link in the chat. Please click the Nearpod link. You can post your thoughts and then you can engage with your uh, colleagues thoughts by using the little heart icon that will pop up on the sticky notes. Awesome pacing. I see Carlin talking about um, potential unfinished learning that students might have and addressing it using the unfinished or the foundational standards. I like a few people have said it like it keeps you focused on the end, right, or the outcomes that need to happen, so you can um, stay focused on those outcomes throughout the entire module. I like this, Gerald guide my purpose for why I am teaching those skills, right? It gives meaning to the lessons. Beautiful. Give about 30 more seconds. Continue to share your thoughts.
Beautiful. You should think of this teacher edition or this module overview as your sage, your guide, right? It gives you a deep understanding of the story of math for that particular module, as well as how to uh, teach that story of math effectively to your students. I highly recommend doing a study of the module overview with your grade level partners. So if you are working across the district or even within your school and um, people teaching the same grade level, study it together. Make sure you guys are emphasizing the same things for your students um, and just make sure that you, you have that understanding of the math. Thank you for always being so thoughtful. Um, I see a few people posting in the chat. Uh, Ooh, sorry there was an issue, Christy, um, but feel free to just post in the chat if there is an issue with that. At this point, let's take our first break of the day. So five minutes. I'm going to ask for you to be back at 9.29. 9.29. Camera's on, ready to roll in five minutes.
This is your one minute countdown. So in one minute, please be back with your cameras on, ready to roll. All right, it is 9.29, so I'm going to keep uh, pushing forward. There was a great question in the chat uh, from Christy about would Eureka in a remote setting still recommend um, whole group instruction? The, the short answer is yes, because um, the curriculum is based off of whole group instruction as, as, the, um, as the preferred method of teaching. Um, but that being said, in my own experience, so a little bit different than Great Minds, I have seen it done whole group. I've seen it done in small groups. I've seen it done half and half, right? I teach whole group, and then once I see a small group of kids struggling, I'm going to kick everyone else off and just work with them. I've seen teachers record themselves and give that to small groups of students with support. So there's a lot of flexibility that really depends, I would say, on your district and what your district wants you to, to work towards. So I don't want to say like one specific thing, right? Um, but I do think that you should feel empowered to be a little bit more flexible about how you deliver this to really meet the needs of your kids. Um, if there are additional questions, please keep them in the chat and I will try my best to get them answered. All right, so um, we read, right, about those three key shifts, focus, coherence, and rigor. And I said we're going to pause on rigor and talk about it when we get to the lesson components. Let's get to the lesson components and break down rigor now. So the Eureka writers define rigor as having three components, conceptual understanding, procedural skill and fluency, as well as an application of the ideas, okay? And the writers would like for us to pursue all three of those pieces with equal intensity. So as we dig into the lesson level, I'd like for you to keep in mind those three pieces of rigor. Where do you see them and how are they taking place at the lesson level? So the structure of a lesson, grades kindergarten through five, is... Um, one way that rigor is exemplified. There are four components of a Eureka lesson. The first component is a fluency practice between 10 and 15 minutes of every day. The second component is an application problem. Timing varies depending on the problem. The third component is the concept development. You will often see that this is the longest component. This is the heart of the lesson. The last component of a Eureka lesson is a student debrief, and this is often 10 minutes in total. So if you are grades one through five, the um, average Eureka lesson is written to take 60 minutes. So 60 minutes for an entire Eureka lesson, grades one through five. If you're a kindergarten teacher, that drops to 50 minutes. If you're a pre-K teacher, that drops to 25. Andrew, uh, is the application problem like an anchor task? Yes and no. <laughs> so we're going to dive into each one of these components now. When we get to the application problem, I will um, explain that a little bit further. So if I could pause on that question until we get there, um, that would be most helpful. So one of the things I want to emphasize is that you are going to see this image that you see on the screen at the top of every lesson. So it'll have a breakdown of the components as well as that pie chart. This is a recommendation from the writers. You do not need to use this exact breakdown of timing for your lesson. Your students might require that you emphasize different parts. Maybe you need more time for an application problem. But... These are written intentionally, right? So consider the timings, but feel empowered to make adjustments from those times to support the needs of your students. 
So now, as I mentioned, we're going to dig into each one of these four components. To do that, you need two resources, page seven and eight of your virtual engagement materials, and a lesson from your grade level. If you are a grade two teacher, please pick a lesson from a little bit later in your module if you're using module one. Grade two teachers only pick a little bit later of a lesson. The first couple lessons in grade two, the structure is slightly different than what we're gonna talk through. Every other grade level, you're fine. Pick lesson one if that's easiest for you. So, as I mentioned, the uh, first component of a Eureka lesson is fluency. All lessons are going to begin with two or three recommended fluency activities. These activities are going to support the development of flexible thinking and number sense in your students, and they're really driving towards that aspect of rigor we talked about, procedural fluency. These activities are all meant to be review material. So we're driving towards fluency. We're not introducing new concepts at the fluency level. Please use your lesson that you've selected and find the fluency section now. Take one minute and read through the activities. I want you to think about how might you apply or deliver these activities in your own classroom. So one minute, please read through the fluency activities of your lesson. All right, I am going to take some time and allow you to be the student now. So I'm going to model three different fluency activities. These are taken from kindergarten, the first module. I know that we're not kindergarten teachers, but I want you to see where do these activities originate from. So to participate as a student, I'm going to ask for you to click speaker view in the top corner. That will keep my uh, face nice and big so you can see. I'm also going to ask for you to stay muted so we don't have a lot of uh, competing screens, uh, but I am going to ask for you to be counting. We're going to do counting activities with me. Um, so please count, but stay muted, okay? So go ahead and um, show me your hands just like this. Beautiful. We're going to start counting the math way. So show me your left pinky. Beautiful. And we're going to be counting by a unit of one. So starting at one, count with me, please. One, two, three, two, one, two, three, four, five, four, five, four, five. Six, five, six, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the hardest one, ten. Good. Close it up. So that is counting the math way. It's probably natural to start counting on our thumbs or our index fingers, right, when you're typically counting. But counting the math way has some specific mathematical advantages. First, Eureka, we really believe in that kinesthetic connection. 
We want kids to see and feel the numbers that they are experiencing and saying with their language. That's an important step. Second, you noticed that I asked for you to start with your left pinky. We start here because we want students to see that numbers increase as we move one direction, right, and decrease as we move the other. Left to right is specific to number lines. So by counting this way, they are foundationally already seeing a number line happen. They're seeing it increase one more, one less, as the foundation to addition and subtraction. Two notes. You're going to see counting the math way grades kindergarten through five. What you can do is change the value of the units. So instead of counting by ones, let's count by eighths. One eighth, two eighths, three eighths, two eighths, one eighth. Same sequence, different, more complex unit. I could even go up to fours. Four, eight, twelve, eight, twelve, right? And follow that same general idea. Counting this way, kindergarten through fifth grade, means that kids are very familiar with it and can think about that complexity of the unit increasing, right? Quick note, you were just the students, so you did your left pinky. When you facilitate as a teacher, you want to mirror your students. So you're going to use your right pinky. Practice that now. So you're actually going to do the opposite so your kids know and see the left pinky. Beautiful, okay? So that's counting the math way. This time, I'm going to ask for you to show me a number on your hands the math way. So we start here, close it up. Show me two the math way. Good. You can count individually or put both fingers up at once. Close it up. Show me six the math way. Good. Close it up. Show me three the math way. Good. Close it up. Show me eight the math way. Good. Close it up. The last activity is going to be called show me another way. So I'm going to ask for you to show me three the math way. Good. Close it up. Show me three another way. So I see this, I see some of this, I see this, right? If I'm a kindergarten teacher, I'm going to look around the room and be like, what? I see lots of crazy things. How do we know that we're all showing three? And this is where you would take students through counting sequences to be able to um, say that we all have three, okay? But those are building that fluid and flexible thinking in our students about numbers. You're going to see lots of different kinds of fluency activities. So the three I just showed you is one type. You could take a whole training on fluency, so like a four-hour session like this, and where you would engage with all different types of fluency activities. It's important that you understand that the fluency in each lesson, the activities, are a menu. Pick the activities that will help support the development that your students need. So you don't need to teach all the activities. Pick the ones that are really gonna drive home the skills of fluency that your students need to develop. Next, we are going to actually observe fluency take place in a kindergarten classroom. This is Mrs. Gutierrez's classroom. She is one of the writers of Eureka Math and she's going to take her students through two different activities. You're going to see one, a rec and rec is the tool she's going to use, and then the other is a counting sequence like we just practiced. As you are watching this video, I want for you to focus in on how do the activities she's leading support the development and uh, number sense, that fluid, flexible thinking in those kindergarten students, okay? So how does it support uh, the development of number sense and fluid, flexible thinking? It's on me, on a math tool. There are some beads here. I'm gonna slide the beads over and I want you to say how many. Ready? 
counting activities. Counting is a big part of the fluency activities you're going to see. But thinking of those two activities, how do they support the development of number sense and the fluid, flexible thinking about numbers in those kindergarten students? Seal is going to dismiss us to another breakout room. This time you're going to be with a, more than a partner. And I don't know how the rooms will break out. Um, you are going to have five total minutes to discuss 
at the end of five minutes, um, you are going to see a 60 second timer pop up. Use the full 60 seconds to wrap up your conversation and then come back. Our Zoom will bring you back. Uh, when we get back, I'm going to be looking for volunteers who can summarize or share what you and your group discussed. So please bring that courage when you get back to share what you and your group discussed. See you whenever you're ready. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. So the video is exactly what you'll see in kindergarten classrooms. They practice that, that counting daily. And um, what I like is, so the five, what we saw in the video, the five in one is six. They're beginning to, to start that, that work on addition and how grouping numbers together. And, and the way that she did her hands, starting up here, they were doing the part, part, whole. So they were kind of laying that foundational groundwork of the beginning addition without introducing the word plus, which is something that in kindergarten we talked a lot about that um, we were introducing, and that's a great Ting thing as well. We introduced the word plus too early to our students and it's too abstract for them at that younger foundational age. Yeah, I like the uh, first part of it because she talked about how does it lead to fluid and flexible thinking. Well, they started, you know, just kind of going up by one with the wreck and rack, but then they had to go backward and then forward again and then they start skipping around. So it was less predictable than, you know, traditional just counting and skip counting. Uh, so they couldn't just fall into a pattern because a lot of kids, especially like when I taught third and we were learning multiplication, they could get those facts if they were in order in that pattern. Yep. But to be able to go back and forth and kind of go a couple steps ahead shows that they really have it and understand it. So. Yeah, and you'll see first grade uses the rec and rec a lot as well and they get into the bigger numbers and they start the patterning of counting by twos and, mm -hmm. and doing that skip counting, which we know by third, fourth, fifth, they struggle with multiplication because they don't have that strong foundational background. Yeah, that. so that's, that's good to build on those early. I like Eureka. I, it, it was amazing to see what kids could do last year. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how long it takes for us to see that in fifth. Uh, because obviously it's got all these building things in there so hopefully we'll start seeing that I don't know if we will this year but in the next couple of years Mr. Riley what grade are you teach do you teach or uh, also fifth oh, okay so you yeah you're gonna probably not see it quite yet you should see a little bit maybe from the fourth graders but yeah hopefully they've got a little basis of it <laughs> it's all right <laughs> I'll take what I got. Um, I noticed um, I've done a lot of work with number sense, and I think I saw every component of number sense in the lesson. Uh, there's the benchmark of five and ten. There's the um, being able to mentally do plus one and minus one. There's um, the physical and visual representations, and I'm trying to think of the other things I thought, but I I feel like I saw everything that number sense needs and um i love it yeah and they i think also it was laying the groundwork to introduce the number bonds as well yeah i heard you say so, that yeah part part whole yeah. yeah so i was a part of um a grant program training that um we use greg tang a lot like he was the consultant behind the the grant work and we did his conferences every year and he came and visited our schools and stuff like that and and it seems like there's a lot of it that lines up with a lot of what he teaches and his friends teach yes, definitely. so I'm on board with all that oh Greg Tang's amazing yeah I know a lot of our teachers went to a lot of Greg, Greg Tang things last year so yeah. Yeah, he does a ton in Kansas City 
<laughs> yeah, he moved here and he's doing um, Saturday meetups now at his, I went to a couple last year at his condo and you just oh. go in the morning and do math and it's hard to go out if he's doing it with the pandemic, but it was fun. Yeah. I love Greg Tate. Yeah. Though I still haven't gotten the fractions yet. It still blows my mind. His <laughs> fractions blow my mind. <laughs> Yeah. Beautiful. Looks like we have everybody back. Using the participants tab, if you are willing to share what you and your group discussed, you can use the raise hand feature. Sorry. Thank you, Tyler. Would um, you want to unmute and share? All right. So uh, I'll talk about what I noticed first was in the first part of the fluency, because um, you talked about fluid and flexible thinking. The just the fact that on the wreck and wreck they started by going forward predictably, you know, one at a time, uh, but then it got unpredictable because she would go back and forward or go a couple steps ahead. And so I thought about that when I taught third grade and taught multiplication, you know, it was really easy for them when we were doing skip counting because it was predictable and they knew what came next, but to be able to go steps ahead or go backwards and forwards was more challenging. So getting them started on that young and not just falling into the patterns is good. Uh, and then another person that was on there with us talked about how um, they're kind of, she said with their hands, we didn't notice at first, but maybe, uh, she noticed they were doing the part, part, whole, and it was laying the foundation for addition, but without putting the term plus in there, uh, because she said they did that a little too early sometimes, but just building that foundation for it. Absolutely, right? I'm not sure who noticed that, right? But she did make a number bond with her hands. She said six is five and one, and she said five and one make six. So she was making the parts and holes representations with her hands. Thank you for sharing that, Tyler. Both strong observations. Uh, Christy, would you like to unmute and share out? I was just going to add on to what you were saying um, with the and. That's really helpful when they get into fourth and fifth grade and they start doing uh, decimals because um, we tear our hair out doing the, we, don't, we say 23 and four tenths and that 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 and is the decimal point so just doing that in kindergarten five and one more like that that will help them a lot as they go through the upper grades thank you for saying that right it all builds on each other and i think what's really important about eureka is to to understand that you're not just a grade three teacher or just a grade five teacher you're really a k5 teacher and understanding that whole progression and how your year is zooming in and focusing on a particular part of that understanding for your students. So if there are no questions or other comments, let's move on to the second component of the application problem. So um, we looked at fluency and, and now application problem. So the application problem is almost every single lesson if you see that the application problem has been removed from a particular lesson, it's because the concept development of that day needs to be longer. So you will see an application problem almost always, but sometimes it's removed in favor of a longer um, concept development. There was a question about, is this an anchor task? Yes, sometimes. So sometimes it directly relates to that day's concept development, other times, it could be trying to stamp or really solidify a key concept from previous lessons or really um, important concept of that uh, module's ideas. So you're going to see it used in kind of multiple ways, but it is a task um, that is really driving towards students' uh, understanding and being able to model with math and talk about math. Right? So it anchors and it relates to sometimes that day's lesson, but uh, more importantly, the big module overview. 
in just a moment, um, Seal is going to release a poll. This poll is asking you, what is your current familiarity with the read, draw, write process? So this is a process that uh, Eureka recommends and just rate your current familiarity with the process. Seal, whenever you're ready. Beautiful. So we're a, kind of across all answers, right? Uh, most of us falling really in that never heard of it, or I know what it is, but I don't use it um, area. Totally okay. Uh, we are going to talk about how to specifically use it as it is the preferred method for Eureka Math. Um, so it is a systematic approach that moves students between this idea of reading and understanding what they're reading and being able to model um, and draw uh, from or, or make mathematical conclusions from those drawings. So you can see the steps to redraw right on the screen. Take 30 seconds and read through those steps. Now, I'm going to ask for you to actually return back to the lesson from your grade level that you've selected, and I want you to find the application problem. Take another minute and read through it. I want you to pay special attention to the sample student work of how you might model, as well as any additional notes or things to consider that are written into the application problem. So take another minute and read through the application problem of your lesson now. All right, I am going to ask for you to be the student again, this time for the application problem. On page 10 of your virtual engagement materials, um, at the top is a chart. At the bottom, underneath that chart, is the same problem that you see on the screen. Uh, you can either use that space or whatever blank space you have to follow along with the problem. Um, I am going to model one way to deliver the um, application problem. This is not the only way to do it, um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I also am going to ask for you to have your chat window open, set to everyone, because I'm going to be asking for quick responses um, at several different points throughout the problem. So, read, draw, write. First step is to read. I'm going to ask for you to read out loud with me. Please stay muted, though. Um, so, starting from the top. Sahid bought 24 pounds of ground beef for a block party. He used one fourth of the beef to make tacos and two thirds of the remainder to make burgers. How many pounds of ground beef did he use to make burgers? Now, I work um, on the west side of the city of Chicago. I have a lot of students who are learning language, uh, English as their second language. So I personally reread the problem two or three times as a choral response for students. 
feel free to do that, right? Um, know your students as readers and, and engage in that way. So once we have read it, we're going to get to the drawing stage and we're going to draw by rereading in chunks. So let's read the first chunk together. Sahid bought 24 pounds of ground beef for a block party. I'm going to pause and ask myself, is there something I can draw to represent this chunk or this part of the problem? I would ask my students and hopefully they would say, I want to represent 24 pounds. So for this particular model, I'm going to choose to use a tape diagram. And I'm going to represent 24 pounds right there on my model. Now, I would ask, let's keep reading. So he used one fourth of the beef to make tacos. At this point, can I add something to my drawing with this new information I have. One fourth of the beef. This means that I want to split my model into four equal parts. And I'm going to label one of those parts tacos. Let's read the next chunk together. And two thirds of the remainder to make burgers. Can I add something else to my drawing with this new information? So two thirds of the remainder. There's three pieces. Two of those pieces I'm going to label with burgers. Let's read the last chunk. How many pounds of ground beef did he use to make burgers? So I don't know the burgers piece, that's what I'm trying to find. So I'm gonna put a question mark over that section so I can stay zoomed into it as I get um, to my uh, understanding my model. So from this model now, I wanna engage with some math thinking. I see that there are four units in my model and those four units have a total or make a total of 24 pounds. Now, I'm looking at my question mark, and I see that in order to find the question mark, I need to know what is the value of one unit. In the chat set to everyone, please type one way I could find the value of one unit. So what is a way that I can find the value of one unit? Beautiful. You guys get it, right? I want to divide by four. So I know the value of one unit is equal to six. But I'm going to go back to my model. To solve for burgers, I don't need to know the value of one unit. I actually need to know the value of two units. In the chat, set to everyone, how could I find the value of two units in my model? Beautiful, so I see six plus six. I see six times two or two times six, both work. I see 24 times one half. 24 divided by four would get me to six, but I wanna know the value of two units, 24 divided by two. Um, so the value of two units then is equal to 12 really amazing that some of you saw that half and maybe you were wondering when I drew my model why did I put burgers where I did I placed it specifically where I did because I wanted students potentially some of my students who are farther on the progression to see that one half right to visualize that two units is actually equivalent to one half here so we solve for burgers. We did the read, the draw. The last step is the write. We would ask students to write a sentence to finish the question. How many pounds of ground beef did he use to make burgers? Sahib used 12 pounds of ground beef 
to make burgers. So we could see in this problem how the model really facilitated our understanding of the math, right? We were reading and drawing to help us understand what was happening. Now, I am actually going to jump us back to watching it in a grade two classroom. Um, before we get there, sorry, I jumped too far ahead. So on page 10, um, I modeled one way to deliver it. There are different ways you could model it. So I use the first one, interactive questioning. You could do guided practice, so um, release to students faster. You could even just do independent practice or small groups or, or however you see fit. Um, it really depends on the application problem at hand, right? How much guidance your students really need to get through the problem. Um, so, so look at the problem each day and decide what is going to be the best way to facilitate it. But the way I did it is not the only way to do it. So now let's go to that grade two classroom. This is Mrs. Watts Lawton. She is again one of the writers of Eureka Math. And as she is delivering this application problem with her students, I want you to focus in on the model. So how did the model, she uses a tape diagram and a number bond, help the students in their part whole thinking about the problem? So how did the model facilitate the development of that part whole thinking once again. Everybody ready to read? Yes. Here we go. Everybody all together like a chorus singing, go. A fruit seller buys a carton of 90 apples. Finding that 18 of them are rotten, he throws them away. He sells 22 of the ones that are left on Monday. Now, how many apples does he have left to sell? So, boys, it's a choice. boys and girls, well, it's an interesting problem. So what I'm going to ask you to do is think about it. Talk with a partner. What do we know? Do we know the whole and a part? Or do we know the parts? Talk with your partner. Start with face partner. Partner B, go first. Partner B, face partner. Oh, we got a lost and found situation. Oh, and parts. We know the good parts. And we're going to subtract. But is it, I, I think it's a two-step problem because it's at first saying he throws them away, how many are left, and then So boys and girls, I'd like you to think about how could you show that? What could you draw? What model would show the part whole relationship? What would that look like? Talk with your, talk with your partner. Okay, this time face partner, start with partner A. What kind of a model could you use? Oh. Any way you like. I'm going to show 
two different ways. And you can be modeling as you like. I'm going to show the whole 90 apples. And I'm going to show those two parts. Okay. So what's our first part? 18. What are the 18? What part of the problem is that? 18 is the rotten. The so I'm going to label it rotten. And then the other part is 22. What's the 22? Sold ones. Sold. And how? And where is my question mark? Um, it goes because that we put the question mark there because we don't know how many how many apples are what are are left. Are left. I think I I can solve that. So we could have this. We could also do it as a number bond with ninety. And it's okay to have more than, usually we have the whole in one part. We can have more than one part. Here we do. We have 18, and we have 22, and here's our question mark. Okay, so, ooh, so go ahead and solve to find out how many apples he has left. Which, which would be more efficient? Or would it be easier to take 18 out of 90 and get one answer? And out of and the other. arm. Think about it as arms holding the entire amount. So, there you go. Okay. Now, what are the parts that you know? Um, we know. 18 and 22. Okay, so show that. <laughs> Hold on one second, sweetheart. There's my answer. <laughs> Keep going. I'm going to stop because we have to move on. Who would like to share? All right, sweetie, so take a seat. Who, who would like to share what they did? Can I see it first? Okay. All right, I'm going to ask you if you can explain. Can I go next? No, we're only going to do one, sweetie, because we don't have time for everybody. Uh, could I ask you to turn the lights off, Precious? Okay, so let's listen to Caden explain what he did. What I did is I, I, I used um I, I added Wait, can you first show us where's your part hole model? Um, oh, I did the number bond okay. to show 90 is the hold, 18 are right, and 22, and this is the, this is how many are left. Okay. So what I did, I, I, I added a like and I added 8 and, two, 8 and 2, that gives me 110, and 20 and 10, that gets me to 30. And I, and I know my basic fact, three, 3 plus 1 is 40, so 30 plus 10 is 40. And I know my, so now I have to take, so now my number sentence is 90 minus 40. And I know my basic facts because it, you're just going up in the higher number. 9 minus 4 is 5, so 90 minus 40 is 50. Thank you. The only thing is that I love that kid. <laughs> so how did the use of that model uh, support the development of their part whole thinking? Uh, Seal is going to send you back to your breakout room. Uh, five total minutes at the end of four is our 60 second timer. Ignore it. Don't press it. Use the full 60 seconds to wrap up. And when we get back, I will be looking for a few participants to share out. Seal, whenever you're ready.
Hello again. Hello again. I love that kit. <laughs> that, that made my teacher heart happy. <laughs> basic math facts. I know my basic facts. I heard one kid uh, drop the, well, something like, first of all, you know, like, <laughs> that cracked me up. Yeah, just even hearing some of the conversations kind of in the background when it was really focused on something else, you hear kids do using good terms to kind of argue with each other and point things out. So. It should, I would think it would make your fifth grade hearts happy because I know that problem solving is something that our older students have struggled immensely with. Mm. So to see second graders uh, laying that foundation of how to attack a problem, how to draw it out, how to explain it, it should really help you in a few more years. <laughs> yeah, and especially just to do it so much that it becomes natural because exactly. what you get with the fifth graders is some of them are just lacking problem solving entirely, but right. some of them know how to do it. They just don't want to. It's not right. a natural thing they use all the time. So to have it become that natural tool that you know, we're going to use problem solving skills in every situation, then it becomes something that will pull out more often than not try to avoid it so yeah I like that um yeah just the fact oh go ahead oh, go ahead I'm sorry just the fact on that um that she started by showing them two different ways to do that model uh kind of opens it up for them that you know there's different ways to do it but it's the same thing it's starting with that hole and breaking into parts to find the missing part it's it's all going towards the same end goal there it's just whatever it looks and works best for them so I think exactly that's going to definitely help them get that kind of thinking. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. It was giving them some choice on how to attack it. They obviously had worked on different strategies, but they, um, in product, you're going to get there, but you have the kids have some say in how they get there and what they're comfortable with. Yeah. Mr. Riley, have you done Eureka before, or is this new for you? Um, it's a little bit new. Um, we use Engage New York bits and okay. pieces here and there. Um, and I mean, I, I didn't use it all that much just because I, every time I tried to go in, it kind of felt like if you weren't doing it all year long, it was hard to bring in piecemeal. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't really use too much of it, but I've seen the lesson overviews and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, so far, I like what I see. Good. Yeah, and I know in the manuals, if you're not quite sure, it, it has that component in it that it will walk you through step by step if you're not sure. Or you can, you know, if you, once you know what, you know, you feel comfortable with their process, you can just do it. But they also give you both ways. And we were expected last year 100%. Um, uh, uh, we were to follow it 100%. So we're kind of still there this year because we haven't went through a whole year yet because of the pandemic. So, yeah, <laughs> we're still there. Okay. But people like it. <laughs> yeah, I know last year I think it was overwhelming for people at first. Okay. But I didn't really hear any of that as the year went on. So I think people got used to it and it kind of started flowing very naturally. Yeah, and they started seeing results with kids and that really excited them. Mm -hmm. So they were skeptic at first. But. But yeah, I know around parent-teacher conference time, everybody was a little uh, yeah. burned out worried. I had a lot of conversations with parents about, well, you might need to talk to Ms. Kennedy, but it's okay. Everybody's struggling with it right now. It's new and there's a lot into it, but... And our Eureka trainers just kept saying a year ago, trust the process, trust the process. And they, they were right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. I'll see yeah. you again. There they come. Beautiful.
using the participants tab and the raise hand feature if you're feeling courageous and willing to share what you and your group discussed. Tammy, thank you. Unmute and share. Uh, my group kind of talked about how we really liked how this, um, the di tape diagram and the number bonds was kind of like a template for the kids to kind of know, okay, this these numbers that I'm reading, where do I put them? It kind of gave them a template as to where, where to start. Absolutely, right? And she gave a lot of freedom of which one works better for them. So there is that autonomy to, to help students um, solidify their thinking. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, any other participants want to share what you discussed? Sherry, thank you. I was in a breakout room with two fifth grade teachers, and we just discussed looking at a video from second grade, uh, doing giving the kids some choice in how they attack a problem, laying the groundwork, how that's really going to help them in fifth grade, because problem solving is an area that our students struggle with at the fourth and fifth grade levels. So, so doing that foundational groundwork and, and practicing it continuously is going to be wonderful for our older students. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, right? So we have covered quite a bit in these two very quick hours. Um, we started with that module overview and understanding the structure of the curriculum overall. We looked at those three key shifts and how focus, coherence, and rigor, which we're exploring right now, are really foundational to the entire curriculum. And we looked at those first two components of the lesson, fluency and application problem. I'm going to ask for you to take 30 seconds to a minute to jot down any of your final Eureka or uh, reflections, maybe next steps. So using page three of your virtual engagement materials, jot down some key understandings from the first part of our session together. We um, are now going to take a short break. You have a few extra minutes um, because we're ending just three minutes or so early. Uh, so we are going to continue part B of this session at 1045. Um, so you do not need to log out of our session. That will probably make it more complicated. Uh, you can feel free to just uh, close out your video, uh, walk away, get whatever you need. But I am going to start at 1045. Uh, please be ready to go um, at 1045. All right, see you back in a little bit.
All right, this is your one minute countdown. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started in one minute. Finish up, get yourself settled, cameras on, ready to go in one minute. All right, it is 1045, so I am going to go ahead and get started and take us through part B of our session. Um, I am going to skip over norms. I feel like we get it. We understand. We, we know how to operate. Uh, so hopefully that will buy us a little bit of time and we can potentially end a few minutes early as well. Um, so... In part A, we dug into those first two components. We looked at fluency activities and we looked at application problem. We are now going to dig into those second two components. But one of the key ideas I want you to be taking away from lessons in general is that they are a menu, right? It is suggested activities and suggested notes and deliveries from best practice of the writers but you along the way need to be using your own teacher expertise and autonomy to make decisions to better support your students. So as we dig into these last two components of a lesson, I really want you to keep that in mind in terms of how am I going to really make this work for my students because that is such a key component um, for you to consider. So you are gonna need, again, page seven and eight from your virtual engagement materials. We're still there. You're also still gonna need the lesson that you selected from your grade level because we're gonna dig into the last two components. So uh, the third component um, is going to be uh, the concept development. Now, I did mention earlier that sometimes that application problem is removed in favor of a concept development. It's not often, but it does happen. Roughly, the concept development is between 30 to 40 minutes of that day's lesson. Okay, so it is the heart of the lesson. It is the biggest chunk. It is where new learning for that day is introduced. I want you to go ahead and find the concept development of your lesson. I'm going to ask for you to take two full minutes and read through as much as you can. Make note of the models, make note of the language, make note of the exchanges and the thinking that is expected of your students throughout the um, concept development. So take two full minutes and read through your lesson uh, concept development now.
Hopefully you were able to read enough of it to get a feel of the concept development. You probably noticed it looks like a script. T, S, T, S, T, S, and this back and forth. I want to emphasize that in no way is the concept development intended to be used as a script. So it is not at all supposed to be used as a script. Think of the concept development as you would the most experienced mathematician or math teacher that you know. You maybe go to them often and are like, how do you teach this? What tips and tricks do you have as you go through, as you've taught this with students before? So think of it as a seasoned colleague there to support your understanding and how to break down the concepts and what to emphasize with your students using important language. As with the whole curriculum, there's going to be parts that you're like, ooh, that said really well. I'm going to steal that because I want to say it that specifically to my students. Maybe there's another part you're like, Ooh, I like how they're modeling this, but I want to say it this way, emphasizing this, because my kids, that will make more sense to them. Maybe there's a whole problem. Maybe there's a whole section that you're like, ooh, no, that's not going to work for my kids. Don't use it, right? If it doesn't fit for your kids, don't use it. Insert something else or just ignore that completely. So how you use the concept development should be flexible and it should be based off of your own expertise and the data of the students who are sitting in front of you. A couple other notes that I want to make about the concept development. First, um, you see a green box uh, in my example. You're going to notice these little boxes throughout your lessons. These are called UDL boxes. UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. So they are additional considerations that you might consider as you support all types of learners. So students who are developing English as their um, second language, students who might be struggling with a concept, students who might need more hands-on materials or supports, students who might need enrichment for you to take the concept and move in a different direction, progressing them further along. Always read those green boxes because it will help you make additional adjustments to meet the needs of your students in very intentional and specific ways. All right, so definitely take a look at those. Now, we are not going to experience the concept development as a student would, and before we actually watch it, I want to take us back to a fluency activity. So I'm gonna ask for you to click speaker view again, I'm going to ask for you to stay muted so that um, we're not distracting each other. But I am going to ask for you to return back to the counting sequence with me. You are going to need to keep the chat window set to everyone and have it open, ready for some quick responses. All right, so go ahead and show me your fingers. We're going to continue counting. Starting with our left pinky, this time we're going to be counting by a unit of five. Starting with five, ready? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five, forty, forty-five, fifty. Good, close it up. We're going to keep counting, but I'm going to change the value of the unit to 25 now. So we're going to be counting by 25s, starting with your pinky. Ready? 25, 50, 75, 100. 75, 100, 125, 100, 100, 125, 150. 175, 200, 225, 250, 225, 250. Good, close it up. Please pull open your chat window now. Set to everyone. And tell me what is the value of four 25s? What is the value of four? 25s. Beautiful. You guys are excellent. Now, 
can you tell me what is the value of 10 25s? What is the value of 10 25s? Incredible. So 1, 240, maybe it was this just a quick typo. Using the chat, can you tell me what is the value of 14 25s? What is the value of 14 25s? Beautiful, 350. So without using pencil, paper, whiteboard, marker, even the standard algorithm, you all just multiplied 14 times 25, a two digit by two digit number. This is how important fluency activities are as students are developing the flexibility in which they think about numbers. So as we are about to watch a concept development take place in a grade three and then a grade four classroom, I want you to keep in mind how are students thinking about these numbers in a flexible way. Christy, go ahead and unmute and ask that question you have. Okay, thanks. I was typing it, but it's, this is probably easier. So when I went to the training, um, not this past summer, but the summer before, instead of doing the counting like this, she was doing like up and down and, and stop and think. Yep. So either one is good? Um, you will use both. Okay. Um, so this sequence is like, it's called happy counting. Um, yeah. You can definitely use that. Uh, I would actually say for this particular instance, using your hands is really important because kids can see four and then you can count the yeah. iteration of that. Um, but you will definitely use this for different okay. sequences. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so again, as we jump into these two classrooms, I want you to think about how does that part whole understanding build from what we observed earlier into these classrooms. Now, I want to preface um, the first classroom is a grade three classroom. She has some teacher mannerisms that are not required as part of a Eureka training, okay? So she does some snapping and some stomping, which might not be you at all, and don't feel like you have to teach that way. It is just very specific to her. The emphasis in both classrooms is that there's an exchange repeatedly between a teacher and a student. So I think just keep in mind how might you facilitate that type of exchange in your own classroom, but just ignore the stamp, uh, stomping and snapping and focus on what is the development of part whole um, understanding in the students. How many in each row? Raise your hand when you know. How many in each row? Four. Good. So they call it the fours array because there are four in each row. I want you to circle all at once five fours. Five fours. What do I have to do to show six fours? Three? Add one more. Add one more. Add, add one more four. I like the way you said that. Add one more four. I have six fours. If I show that on my hand, show me six fours with your fingers. Go. Each finger is a unit of what? Four. Good. How many fours are on this hand? Ready? Five fours. Do it again. How many fours are in this hand? Five fours. Ooh, much better. How many fours are in this hand? Five fours. So we know that five fours and one four is what? Six fours. Good. So I can break it apart into what's the first part? What's the other part? Uh oh, I need two more people. Makai, you with me? Your nice day, Adori. One more. 
Give that first expression right here. What's it going to be? What's the other one, Ariana? And how many fours is that? Good. Thumbs up. She's right. We're not drawing it yet, Adori. I love that you're ready, but not yet, not yet. All right, hands down. What's the product of five times four? The product of five times four. Why? What's the product of one times four? Oh. Four. So we know that six times four is? Twenty-four. So as we jump into the grade four classroom, how did you see that um, part whole relationship or building in that uh, from the primary grades into grade three and then now into the grade four concept development? Let's go back to let's go back to the area model that we use to solve the application problem about Sally's plants. Okay, so we solve twenty two times forty two by first thinking about two forty twos and then adding that to the part and product of twenty forty twos. If you could please erase your whiteboards, I'd like you to set up twenty two forty twos vertically. We're going to do the same thing in our algorithm. We're first going to multiply 2 times 42, or find the value of 2 42s. Watch me. 2 ones times 2 ones is... Say it. 4. Let's record 4 in the ones place. Do it if you will help me. Then, two ones times four tens. <coughs> two ones times four tens. Say it. Eight. Hold on a second. Let's think about that. What's two times four? Say it. Eight. So two times four tens is? Eight tens. Eight tens. I'll record eight in the tens place. Do it. Remind me, where in our area model did this first partial product come from? Where in our area model did this first partial product come from? Tell a neighbor. Two, five, I'm going to draw an arrow to the area model to represent where this partial product came from. We solved 2 times 42 to get 84. Couldn't we also thought of this, this 84 as being 2 42. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Okay. In order to find the second partial product, what did you do in your area model? In order to find the second partial product, what did you do in the area model? Tell your neighbors. So we're going to do the same thing in the algorithm. We're going to find 20 times 42. Let's do it together. Watch. 2 tens times 2. Two tens times two. Say it. Four tens. Some of you were saying, I gave it to you in uniform, so give it back to me in uniform. Ready? Two tens times two is? Four tens. Watch how I record four tens. Four tens I'll record as 40. Do it. Does it make sense that I recorded four tens as 40? Of course it does. Isn't it the same? Four, four times the same thing as four. Now let's find the value of two tens times four tens. Raise your hand if you know the value of two tens times four tens. Say it. Eight Say it again loudly like you know it. Two tens times four tens is? Eight hundred. Where do you think, if, we're, if the product is eight hundred, where do you think we'll record the eight? In what place value? The hundreds. Watch me record eight. You've just solved a two-digit by two-digit multiplication problem using the standard algorithm. 
<coughs> Let's try another one. How many times do we Go ahead and find the total product. Find the sum of our two partial products. Do that now. one more together. I'd like you to set up 46 times 63 vertically. This time we're going to forego using the area model. If you feel like it'll help, if you feel like it'll help you be successful, you're free to, to, to draw one on your own. We're, I'm not going to go on the board. I would like to just go ahead and multiply using standard algorithm into partial products. What expression represents the final product? Raise your hand if you know what expression represents our final product. Talk to your neighbors. Where do we think this final product comes from? Jessica, you know it. You know it. What, ex what expression represents our final product? Say, Jessica. 63 times. Flip the, flip the factors around, say it the other way around. You got it. And doesn't it make sense that 6 63s plus 40 63s would be the same thing as 46 63s? I'd like you. So, focusing on those part whole understanding, how did you see it build from this morning into grade three and grade four? Seal is going to dismiss you into a breakout room. Please discuss with your group for five total minutes. At the end of four, the box pops up. Ignore it. Use the full 60 seconds. And when we get back, I'm going to be asking for you to share your reflections. Seal, whenever you're ready. All right, we're back. Hello. Oh. I feel like this question's a little hard to answer just because I'm so used to part whole relationships and it's just infused in so much of everything that it's hard to get specific about like how does this show part whole relationships. But I mean it's it's just everything is kept in groups and they keep like separating out an individual and bring them back together and just keep going with that process over and over. I mean, I think you said it, it's, it's there and evident in every grade level, the part whole relationships. The only difference is the increase in the activity that they're doing the rigor and the difficulty of what it is that they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. And I find um, we introduced the algorithm way too early without really explaining it. So watching that fourth grade video, even though they were beginning to work the algorithm two digit by two digit, there was still that explanation of what it meant. Yeah. So it's, we just kind of taught the process prior. They're learning, okay, this is what this means. They, they have a, I think they'll have a better understanding of what all of it means. Yeah, he didn't just teach the steps of the algorithm. Exactly. Basically what he did was taught the other methods, like the uh, area model method, right. that showed how it could look different by following the algorithm. But it was he made sure that they knew it was still the same thing, basically. Yeah. I like how he did it. You know, it's the two ones times two ones. Yeah. yeah really, really this is two patient. times two here. Yeah. So. I I know when I was learning this a lot of years ago, um, like place value really wasn't a part of it at all like you know you said two times two and then you said two times four like you didn't go two times 40 you yeah. know you didn't have all that in there you just did each individual number and then you added zeros when you went down to the next line for some reason and nobody told me the reason until i was I was the like a teacher yeah i remember my teacher just saying just do it the way i told you to do it you'll be yeah. able to do it well, that's why parents, you know, get kind of frustrated with math when we show them different strategies because they're like, well, we just learned it this way. And we'll, 
do you understand what that way means to you? Right. I mean, maybe you do now, but did you at the time? Uh, so teaching it and relating it to that way, because you know parents are going to go over the algorithm with them and say it. So you're still teaching them the algorithm, but you're making it make sense yeah. for what it actually is. There's a, there's a great part of an old Andy Griffith episode where he's teaching his son long division and like he's just going through the steps and his kid asks him every time well why do you put that number there and why did you do that and why did you like have this here and and he just like it's just the way you do it (laughs) and it's so funny that like even back that long ago like people still notice like why are we doing this (laughs) and there's not really an answer to that and like they're I'm sure there were only a very few people who could answer those types of questions. Well, why do you put the number up top there? Who knows? It's just the way we do. <laughs> yeah, I also like the end of the fourth grade video. He um, he told the kids, "We're just going to go. We're just going to do the algorithm. But if you need to draw the area model, please do so." So there were he was kind of differentiating with the students. Yeah, I I do get that, but like the area model is so important all the way through high school, like. You have to be careful not to take it away too early because it's, yeah. it's like critical for everything. Well, and that's why that. you're giving them all these tools that they can come back to and use. You don't just throw a tool away because you get a new one. You got to keep them all around, right? And I think, Tyler, that's exactly how I looked at Eureka last year. Was like we were filling their toolbox like we've never done mm-hmm. before. And they had all these different things they could pull and use. All right. Andrew, you're sharing what we learned here today. What? We've already, we've already done it once, so it's your turn. I know you guys have, but other groups have it. for people. <laughs> you need to put the other groups on the spot. Be brave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See ya. Bye. No. <laughs> All right. My Nearpod isn't working, so I'm going to skip. Okay. All right, welcome back. Using the participants tab, if you are willing to share out what you and your group discussed, please use the raise hand feature. If you haven't noticed, I have impeccable wait time. It's one of my strengths. So go ahead and and, and take your time or don't. (laughs) Hi, Christy, I see you. Are you wanting to share out? Oh, I thought you were saying raise hand. <laughs> uh, real raise Sorry. hand. <laughs> Sorry, no, I was talking to another teacher. <laughs> I do see lots of you smiling, so uh, you've got something to say. Stephanie, you've got such a nice smile. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. If you'll unmute and share, thank you. Uh, I'm just, I'll share what we were talking about there. Um, the part about the algorithm really stood us to, stood out to us, so we spent a lot of time talking about that. We know that's something parents for sure know when they want their kids to know, and so rather than him avoiding and not teaching it at all, uh, he taught it in the context of what he had already been taught and used that to build on what was already there and I like the way like it's not just two times two it's two ones times two ones that way when you get to the other column there then you've got the four tens times two ones and so it makes sense to them and what they've already been learning so it's not just abandoning everything else and going to this new method because it's quicker it's well this new method is actually the other method just shaped a different way yeah Actually, one of my favorite things about that grade four video is that kids are doing the thinking of the algorithm all along. And so the algorithm becomes a record, a way to record what they're thinking instead of these steps that you must follow in order to get a right answer, right? So two tens times two ones is four tens. Well, it makes sense that I'm going to record four tens is 40, right? It's kind of what he says. Rather than two times two, you put the four here, right? And then you put a magic zero in and all those things. 
they're already doing that thinking. They're breaking the number into parts and multiplying with those parts and then just recording it in the actual state of the algorithm. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, hey, and, Lauren, yeah. can I just jump on top of that because it's actually Please. quiet for a moment? Yeah, go but ahead. I, when we first brought um, Eureka Math four years ago, and I had done such a good job of drilling into our teacher's head like second grade, the expectation was that students would not know or have mastered the standard algorithm for addition and subtraction. That was the fourth grade. And so when they saw that second grade had in there the standard algorithm, they were coming like saying, oh, but you told us no. And I really learned then that um, what they were showing was the model with the algorithm next to it. So they were making that connection between the concrete and the pictorial right to the abstract. And I had not really thought that if we only stayed at that model and never really helped to make them that connection and just said, oh, it's fourth grade, you're going to do the app, you're going to do the algorithm, then that then we're doing them a disservice that we're helping them just make the connection between the model and the algorithm and that we do want them is most efficient. So we want them to get there. And I loved that. And that first year, my granddaughter was actually in the second grade. And so I got to do that with her and, and practice it a lot. And um, same thing with multiplication. The expectation in fourth grade is not that they've mastered that standard algorithm, but that we have definitely may help make those connections between the partial products, the area model, and the algorithm. All right, thanks for letting me share. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Seal. Christy, did you want to add on? Yeah, I was just going to add on to what Seal was saying, because we kind of talked about that in my group, too, that, um, you know, even when we learned the algorithm, like, nobody told us why you put a zero there. We just knew that we put a zero there. Like, and I'll be quite honest, until I started teaching fifth grade math, I don't know that I understood why we put a zero there even still as an adult. So I think it's really good. Um, I, and I love the algorithm. Like I am a proponent of it. <laughs> like, um, but at the same time, if kids don't know what that zero means, or if it's just a, um, a thing they do because they do it, then that's going to get harder when they get into algebra and, and the higher math. So um, I am just one of those people, like I am a, I will fight for the algorithm constantly, but I also understand that if they don't have that conceptually, then the algorithm will do them no good. Yeah, right. And I mean, very frankly, the algorithm is an expectation in the standards, right? So you should be fighting for it. Kids have to do it. At some point, their thinking has to become efficient so they can attach to new learning in, in the later grades. And I think that's the point here of the algorithm is a record of the understanding and thinking they have about numbers so they can do it efficiently and fluently um, as they progress into higher grades. Thank you. That was a thoughtful discussion. One other note I really do want to make um, visible from the grade three video is she actually pulled out five fours and six fours and made the number bond with her hands too. So she is drawing in that kindergarten understanding as they were learning the multiplication facts. So she said, oh, it I have five fours and one more four makes that six fours. So six fours is 24. So you're going to see a lot of that type of stuff happen throughout the curriculum. All right. The last part of a concept development is the problem set. The problem set is not a fifth component of a lesson. It is 10 minutes of your concept development every day. So if you have 32 minutes on your lesson for the concept development, 22 is the back and forth between you and the students, and 10 is this independent student-led work time. You should notice with every problem set that you um, are delivering that the problems move from simple to complex. They often move from this pictorial representation to the abstract work. Um, and they are, again, a menu of options. Some of your kids are going to complete all of that in 10 minutes, 
but you as a teacher should definitely pick out the problems that kids have to be able to do in order to show mastery by the end of that 10 minutes. So it's not necessarily the expectation to get them all done, but which are the most important, and that's part of your study as you prepare to teach. I want you to find the problem set in your lesson, solve a couple problems, and I want you to pay special attention to how it moves from simple to complex, concrete pictorial to abstract. Go ahead, take a minute. Great question, Nicole. So if you didn't notice in the chat, Nicole put a question, how would you do these problem sets virtually? Again, that really depends on your district, but there are a couple different ways that you could do them. Um, you could assign the PDF. So in just a little bit, I'll show you the digital suite that you guys have access to, where you can find an electronic version that you could attach for students. Um, you could make them into a Google form you or whatever like techno or whatever website that you guys are using Nearpod you could create them into Nearpod um, and allow students to engage with them that way. Um, I've seen where schools have like printed out the module and delivered it to kids and then kids have to take like a picture and send a picture to a teacher with the work completed. Lots of different ways that you could be creative about it and I would actually follow the recommendations of your district over what I would say, because I don't want to say something that your district would not prefer for you to do. But um, if you look at the problem set on the slide, this is, coordinates to the grade four classroom. I want to point two ways that it's moving from simple to complex, because you'll often see these in your problem sets. So if you look at the first page compared to the second, an area model is provided, then it's taken away. Then a guide of the algorithm is given. And then the last two problems, it's blank. Kids have to produce it all on their own. So it's moving kids towards that really abstract thinking. Another way that you're going to see these move from simple to complex are the specific numbers that are chosen for each problem. So if you look at problem one, it's 23 times 54. Problem two is 46 times 54. You can see 46 is 23 doubled. So they're still staying with the same numbers and building that um, procedural fluency with the algorithm, but just changing the complexity ever so slightly with doubling numbers. Then the numbers get even more complex. The last problem involves those sevens and those eights, which are often very tricky and tricky together. Um, so that's how it's gonna progress. Um, as you are preparing to teach, look at that attention of detail um, or to that level of detail because you will notice it. So let's pause for some of those Eureka or aha moments after our concept development. Using page three or your own note catcher, write down a reflection or maybe a next step for yourself.
All right, we've made it to the final component of a Eureka lesson, which is the student debrief. I'm going to ask for you to pull up the lesson that you have been looking at, and I want you to take uh, one minute to read the entire student debrief. It starts with the lesson objective. So read through all components um, and consider how might you deliver this, or really what is the purpose of a student debrief at the lesson level. So what is the purpose of the student debrief? All right, keeping that lesson nearby, I'm gonna ask for you to pull up in your chat, said to everyone, and I'd like you to share one question from your student debrief that resonated with you. So one question from your student debrief that resonated with you. You can type it into the chat. Kendra, do you have a question? Yeah, so is this like a question that the student debrief is asking the students, or is this a question that like might have popped in my head about the student debrief? Um, great clarifying question. One of the questions you would have asked of students during the student debrief. As soon as you have your question typed, I actually want you to scroll through those of your colleagues and see if you can start to generalize what is the purpose of this student debrief? What are you noticing about these questions? Using the participants tab and a lot of courage, looking for some raised hands of folks who might be able to share a little bit about what you're gathering the purpose of the student debrief is. 
What role does it play? Stephanie, thank you. Please unmute and share. I saw a lot of questions that were looking for students to find relationships and patterns. Beautiful. And so what purpose does that serve? I think it allows them to go deeper and have an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing and to connect the problems so that the next time they come to it, they don't just see it as another problem to do, but I already know how to do this. Beautiful. You said that wonderfully, right? Any other thoughts about the purpose of a student debrief? Sherry, go ahead and unmute and uh, share out. I think it's a way to wrap up the lesson, also to reiterate your learning objective for that day. It's also a time for the teacher to get maybe an informal way of checking for understanding. Where are we? And it should help drive your lesson for tomorrow. Absolutely, right? So Stephanie, I heard you say kind of this idea of metacognition, getting kids to think about their thinking so they can start to anticipate some of what might be coming and really dive into that understanding that, that, that is at play. And Sherry, what I heard you say is really stamping the learning for the day, making sure that they have the language, making sure that the concept is sticky in their brains. And if not, let me address those misconceptions before we move on for the day, right? And so it really does serve this kind of dual purpose of giving kids a chance to think about their thinking, but also you as a teacher to really close out and solidify that day's learning. Awesome. So the student debrief is going to, um, we're, sorry, we're going to watch the student debrief in the kindergarten classroom now. So we have already been with um, Mrs. Gutierrez and we're gonna go back to that same kindergarten lesson now, but observe the back end of her lesson. Um, as she is delivering the student debrief, I want you to pay attention to what are the essential components of her debrief. So what are those teacher moves she's doing to really solidify this idea of getting kids thinking about their thinking and really solidifying and addressing those misconceptions that might be true, okay? So essential components. We are gonna jump into the video um, as, as students are finishing the problem set. So she's finishing their independent work and transitioning into the student debrief. Already got it set up. Hey, and Eight and three. Six equals three plus three. Can you draw a picture to match that sentence? Yeah. I wonder what that would look like. Two. And 
And what does it make? Six. Are you just saying six because you see six up there? No. How do you know it really makes six? What did you do to be sure? I counted. Oh, I hear some people counting. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, you counted? Okay, well, you counted right, so that is true. There are three different sentence here, sentences here. There's two of them that match this picture. Two of them match. One of them does not go with this picture at all. See if you can figure out which one is the mistake. Oh, don't say it yet. Turn and talk to a partner. Talk to your partner. See if you can figure out which one is the mistake. What is there six of in this picture? There's nothing with six? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What do you see six of? Everything. Everything. What is there five of? What is there one of? X. X. And when we put the five circles and the one X together, we see six. six. Good. Let's keep that one a happy face. And how about this last one? Is there one of something? Yes. What is there one of? X. X. So the one matches this X. What does the five go with? The circles. Oh, so the five goes with the circles. And what does the six go with? The stars. Everything. Everything. What were the essential components of her student debrief? Uh, Seal is going to send you to your breakout room. Five total minutes. Ignore the box. Use the full 60 seconds. And when we get back, I'm going to be looking for some responses to share out. Seal, go ahead. All right, welcome again. Oh. I would say she was reiterating the, the part, part, whole again. Um, I liked how she, it wasn't find the right answer, it was which one does it fit the wrong answer. There was the beginning foundations of teaching back families. Yeah, I mean, I think everything is kind of showing us how all the learning's connected and keeps coming back around. So. Everything just keeps building up. Yeah, and I, I can see how the debrief is a good way to, to just kind of quickly check from any misunderstandings. If there's a student that's not getting it, then it would kind of should drive you to tell you I might need to pull Susie or Johnny next tomorrow because I noticed they're not they're they're not quite getting it. Mm -hmm. And I like the language that she used. And the little what was it? What did the little boy ask? What's that? <laughs> I can't remember, but it was funny. I would chuckle. He'd never heard one of the vocabulary terms that she used. Total, I believe. He was total. <laughs> That's one thing I noticed in the primary. They are very authentic with the vocabulary, which I don't know if we were before, but I think it's really important that we teach the students the correct vocabulary, even in kindergarten and first grade and build that foundation. Well, it's nice that we're all doing Eureka, so we all have the same vocabulary, too. It's not going to change from year to year, depending on who they have as a teacher. So they'll have that can consistency. I agree with all of it. <laughs> of course you do. And you know, it is your turn. Tyler went to Yeah, I know. I had to <laughs> save you. I was waiting for you to do it and give your great Andy Griffith example. But oh, I like that. that. Just keep that for us inside. Oh, okay. Keep it in the room, right? It feels special. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That would be a good clip to pull up when you teach that uh, division to your kids as an opening. Show them that. 
And be like, why is it in black and white? Exactly. <laughs> What's happening? That's so cool. <laughs> why do they have an Instagram filter on? <laughs> yeah, I, my son's 18 months old, and I turn on the Andy Griffiths show sometimes just for something to watch in the background because it's one of the few things he won't actually turn and stare at the TV. Oh, <laughs> nice. He'll look a little, but then he'll move on. The black and white doesn't interest him. So. Black and white doesn't interest him, huh? Anything else, like, he'll, he'll just stare at the commercials as soon as the commercials yeah. come on. <laughs> like, so bright, yeah. loud and bright and everything. <laughs> yeah, the debrief, there wasn't as much to it. I feel like, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I agree. Kind of connecting back the learning and reflecting on what they've learned and uh, I did, when we were reading through that, I wrote down the word synthesize. I feel like you're synthesizing all the stuff from the lesson and bringing it together. So. Okay, good discussion. I enjoy breaking up with you, gentlemen. Well, thank you. I enjoy Andrew's Star Wars lanyard. <laughs> I'm surprised you can see that that closely, yeah. I can see the X-Wing on there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, now I do see the Millennium Falcon up there, too. Yeah, I think there's a couple of TIE fighters and stuff. He's got a super dirty Captain America one on. So. <laughs> I quit wearing those because I would, like, hang myself. I get it caught. It head. gives me something to fidget with during the day. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Looking for those courageous volunteers now. The participants tab, raise hand. What were some of the essential components you guys observed? Stevie, would you uh, uh, like to unmute and share? Thank you. And then we have Lori. After that, I like how um, she gave them an initial um, wait time before they shared with their shoulder partner of um, how they, um, what their answer and concept was of um, arriving at their answer. Yeah, and why was that wait time important? Do you think? Well, I thought it was important because not uh, each kid had a chance to share versus. Just hear someone else's. Um, so they had, they each had a chance to figure out, to figure out, try to figure out the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think uh, Seal said Lori next. Yeah, our group was talking kind of like what Stevie was saying in a way is that they were able to like explain their thinking, so it wasn't just like three, and three is six, but like. The teacher could see their thought process and how they got to that answer instead of, you know, because at kindergarten, they still have to think that through us. We just say three and three is six, you know, but then <laughs> like showing how they arrived there that way, the teacher can be like, well, it's not really how you do that. But, you know, and that way, when she goes on to build more, that foundation is solid is what we were talking about. Yeah. So what she did is she made their thinking visible. So yeah. she understood what teacher moves she still needed to, to make happen in order to ensure kids were mastering. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have Christy and then Sherry. Um, in our group, we talked about she was asking really great, like, guiding questions um, just to kind of see not only, like, what they were thinking and checking their understanding, but also kind of where she wanted them to, to go next with their thinking. Um, and then she... Um, I know they're obviously those, that's her, te their, I can't talk, their teacher, but um, everyone seemed really comfortable, like giving a response in, in some way, whether it was, you know, verbally or not. So we kind of talked about that a little bit too. Yeah. She definitely had an awesome culture with her students. Thank you. And then Sherry, I'll give you the final word. 
our group kind of briefly talked about the vocabulary and picked up on the little boy who yelled out, let's total. <laughs> but we liked how they're teaching that authentic vocabulary even at the um, younger grades. And one thing that um, we talked about was that was kind of something in our district we were lacking. We were all over the board. But with Eureka, we are now uniformed with our vocabulary up and down. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important, right? Because they're thinking things, but they need to also develop the language to actually explain the ideas that, that are up here, that, that making the thinking visible, um, as Lori kind of mentioned. So thank you uh, for highlighting that. You guys are extremely thoughtful. Thank you. So the last part of a student debrief is going to be the exit ticket. There is an exit ticket every single day, grades one through five. If you're a kindergarten teacher, they do not start until the end of um, the, the year, so module five, I believe. Um, and this is just because kids are developing the need to write, right? And so it takes a little bit uh, of time to get there. You can think of the exit ticket as the purest form of this standard. So it's often going to be two or three questions that is really at the standard level and really aligned to the objective of that day's work. Um, we recommend that you administer the exit ticket every day and collect the work. Whether you grade it or not really depends on your district and, and, and the initiatives you guys are working towards. But at a minimum, look at your student work, right? What thinking have you uncovered? Um, I have heard people that take the exit tickets and sort them. These kids really got it. These kids are really close. These kids really need some adjustments. Based off of that student data, I'm going to look at the next day's lesson and say, ooh, let me zoom in on this fluency activity. Let me teach the application problem with this model. For the concept development, I want these specific problems. Maybe the problem set, I'm going to pull this small group and work with them individually to really adjust, right? But it should inform how you deliver the future lessons and the next part of the module um, that, that is remaining for your kids. So, Find the exit ticket of your lesson, take a minute, solve it, see what is expected of students and how you might use that data to really inform the instruction um, in your own classroom. So find the exit ticket of your lesson and solve it. At this point, what questions can I answer about the concept development, student debrief, problem set, or exit ticket? How can I clarify? All right, if no questions are coming through, um, let's take a five minute break. Um, I will see you back here at 11.55, 11.55, five minute break.
This is your one minute countdown. We're going to go ahead and get started in one minute. Camera's on, ready to roll. All right, it's 11.55, so I'm gonna go ahead and keep rolling forward. Um, at this point, I'm gonna ask for you to have that teacher edition back out um, and within the teacher edition to either find the mid module assessment or an end of module assessment for your grade level. We're gonna briefly talk through the structure of assessments, but please find an assessment from uh, your grade level now. Anyone will do. So I'm going to use the grade three example um, again to talk through the structure of assessments. Um, so just a couple quick points about what you'll see on an assessment and then really what is the intent behind an assessment. Um, so first, like every other part of the curriculum, it's an intentional sequencing of problems. You're going to see that they move from simple to complex and how they expect kids to model um, is going to increase in complexity as well. What you're also going to see in the assessments is that the questions often tie together multiple standards. So question one might not just be three MD4, right? It's going to tie together multiple ideas because it's getting at the heart of the concept that exists at that module. You're also going to see that the questions are the most challenging application of the standard. I'll explain why in just a second. They are all open-ended questions that provides lots of space for students um, to be able to model and explain their thinking. And really the purpose is a dual focus on do the students understand the math and do they have the skill to be able to solve? So do they understand and can they use those skills in a fluent um, and appropriate manner? If you're a kindergarten teacher, assessments are slightly different. Instead of a mid-module, an end-of-module assessment, you're going to see an assessment after every single topic. These um, are given in a one-to-one -one interview based um, style because, again, kids are developing their written uh, language and so we need to be able to decipher. Um, uh, in a little bit, I'm going to take us to the digital suite and you can see examples um, of those within the digital suite uh, if you're a kindergarten teacher. So assessments, these can often be tricky um, to decipher, but what I want to emphasize is that Eureka is used by teachers across the entire country. What is true in Chicago is different than what is true in your district, which is different than what is true in Florida. And so in order to stay at the highest level to increase usability, they are focused on addressing the standards, right? National standards level. And what Eureka considers is actually all forms of student work, counting and fluency, the models and explaining in an application problem, their whiteboards uh, during a concept development, their problem sets, their exit tickets, the student debrief, all of that 
is student data that helps you, the teacher, know what are students fluent on, what do they understand, what are they applying, and what misconceptions are still present. And so really, we want you to be looking at all parts, the whole picture of the student data in order to make those informed decisions about instruction. So this can be a little bit contentious, but I do want to leave some space if you have specific questions. I know, Christy, you had a question about assessments. I definitely want to be able to answer. Yeah, so um, our what we found last year when we were giving assessments is um, we use the Edge Elastic Question Bank, the Eureka mm -hmm. Math portion, and those assessments are different um, online than they are in the Eureka Math book. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if with um, the new system, is, is that the same issue? Like, are they different online than they are in the book? No. So okay. the, probably what you um, experience is Edulastic is not actually endorsed by Eureka. It's not, it's like a separate entity that is probably trying to be aligned, but isn't. Um, the Affirm is written by Eureka writers. And so you will see direct correlation um, a firm even offers topic level quizzes. Um, so if you need some like quick um, assessment checks after every topic, you can get some assessment levels that way. You can also like build assessments. Um, there's greater variety in the types of questions. And so you will see greater alignment um, with the Affirm platform. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions about assessments? So, uh, well, now I have one. Okay. <laughs> and that caused me to think because I know a firm um, are the mid and end of module assessments on a firm now mm -hmm. uh, just like the ones, like the, the paper ones? It, to my they, understanding, yes. Okay. Because they didn't used to be. I'm like with Christy. I mean, they were, they were very different um, and in some ways not nearly as rigorous. As the okay, as the yeah, as the paper ones, as the ones that come within with um, in the teacher edition. So that's why this was something new for me to hear. Um, it, to my understanding, yes. <laughs> if I'm telling you wrong, that's my fault. I deeply apologize for telling you misinformation. But it is my understanding that they are aligned because of some of the um, new products that Great Minds is offering, that there just needs to be that level of alignment within a firm. Okay. All right. Thank you, C. Yeah. I learned something new every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. So um, if there's additional questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'll be sure to pause and answer those. I want to return back to this idea of rigor, though. Remember when I talked about focus and coherence, right? depth and uh, sequencing, rigor had those three components. Um, con concept development or the conceptual understanding, oh, my PowerPoint, uh, procedural skill and fluency, and then application. So I want you to pause and think about those three components. Where have you seen those three components evidenced throughout the curriculum? Where? Do you see evidence of those three components in the curriculum? Go ahead and pull open the chat window and share some of your thoughts. Please make sure it's set to everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll wait a little bit longer to hear a few additional responses.
So I think the most important is what Stephanie shared, right? All three components are in every single lesson. So you are pursuing all three parts of rigor every single day. But it's also this idea of what Carlin shared is the repetition of fluency. So we're allowing kids to gain the, um, that procedural fluency over multiple days because it takes time, right? It doesn't just happen one day. Um, I think this idea of an exit ticket too, right? Like I am really trying to assess where are kids along that progression of understanding and fluency so I can keep pushing and pulling on the right levers to develop it. And this uh, really strong idea of explaining their thinking. That is a huge part of the curriculum and at every part of the lesson, right? Probably less so in fluency, but you can see it happening in the fluency. Um, but that, that, that level of explaining what they're doing is so integral um, to the curriculum. So absolutely way to hit all of those ideas um, really well. Let's pause. Uh, using page three, I want you to jot down any reflections or next steps for yourself at this point of our discussion. So I kind of preface this and ask you to keep this in mind, but, but at this point, you're probably like, wow, there's some really cool stuff in this curriculum. I like this piece. I like this piece. But <laughs> I know the pacing expectations of my district. I know the students sitting in front of me. Maybe this is the first year for fifth graders and there's some gaps. So how do I actually make it work? How do I actually teach these lessons and support the students that are sitting in front of you? We are going to very briefly talk through in the process of preparing to teach and customizing lessons, but please note that this is an entire training. Um, I'll point you in the direction of a few additional resources when we're done, um, but just know I'm just hitting the tip of the iceberg, and this is a skill um, that frankly takes a lot of practice um, and teamwork to, to do it at the level that I think you would probably feel most comfortable with. But uh, Eureka is going to recommend that you use a three-step process as you are preparing to teach and customizing any lesson that you put in front of kids. Those three steps are deeply studying the curriculum so that you can discern the focus and the coherence of a module, of a topic, and even of that K-5 sequence. Doing the math. So understanding how the concept builds across a lesson and across a module. And then the third step is really honing the lessons, looking at it as a menu and picking and choosing the activities um, intentionally to really drive towards mastery for your students. At this point, I'm going to ask for you to turn to page 13 and 14 of your virtual engagement materials. You're going to see a short read titled Preparing to Teach a Lesson from a Story of Units. I'm going to give you two minutes to read through as much as you can. As you read, please turn your cameras off. As you're finished up, please turn your cameras back on. Two minutes.
I'm going to keep moving. As you finish up, just please turn those cameras back on and join me. So again, that first step is really about the story of math. How well do you understand it? And how well can you see how it progresses for students? We want to honor that progression and that story so it doesn't become disjointed, but so math makes sense for our kids. Step two is really about being the student. So at several different points today, I've asked you to be that student. Continue to do that, right? Especially with your colleagues who are teaching similar grade levels and even your colleagues K through five is experience what your students are gonna have to do and think and explain so that you can really push and pull to drive out that understanding for them. And then step three is, is to be the expert teacher that you are, right? Have that autonomy to say, my students need me to teach it this way, so I'm gonna use this as an influence, but I'm also going to support them by offering this scaffold or this enrichment activity to really drive that progression for them. I'm gonna ask for you to turn to page 12 now. Page 12 at the top is a portion of a concept development from the grade three classroom we've already experienced. I'm gonna ask for you to read through that concept development. And then at the bottom of the page, you see this idea of teaching a Eureka lesson with fidelity. So take an additional minute and read through both of those now. All right, so let's look at that concept development that you read, the portion of it, and let's re-watch the grade three classroom. I want you to compare the lesson as it's written to how it was actually delivered. What differences do you notice and why might she have made those changes, right? The big idea is, did she teach this lesson with fidelity? Yes or no, all right? So notice the differences why she maybe made those differences, and consider, was this lesson taught with fidelity? Whenever I think about customizing the lesson for my students, I always think about the simplest, easiest pathway that every single student in my room can get in and get some understanding. And just thinking about where are my students, what do they need to be successful, also knowing what's on the exit ticket, what do they have to be able to do on the exit ticket. So it just is really a lot of, you know, meeting the needs of your students without lowering rigor. How many in each row? Raise your hand when you know. How many in each row? Four. Good. So they call it the fours array because there are four in each row. I want you to circle all at once five fours. Five fours. What do I have to do to show six fours? Three? Add one more. Add one more? Add one more four. Add one more four. I like the way you said that. Add one more four. I have six fours. If I show that on my hand, show me six fours with your fingers. Go. Each finger is a unit of what? Four. Good. How many fours are on this hand? Ready? Five fours. Do it again. How many fours are on this hand? Five fours. 
Better. Much better. How many fours are in this hand? Five fours. So we know that five fours and one four is what? Six fours. Good. So I can break it apart into what's the first part? What's the other part? Uh oh, I need two more people. Makai, you with me? Trinite Day? Adori? One more. Give that first expression right here. What's it going to be? Five fours. What's the other one, Ariana? And how many fours is that? Good. Thumbs up. She's right. We're not drawing it yet, Adori. We've seen the rest. So please pull open the chat and share some of the differences you noticed between what was written in the concept development and how she executed the lesson. Why did she maybe make those choices? Beautiful. So I see she used fingers, pulled it out, made it concrete. She was meeting the needs of her students. She added some background knowledge of how many is in each row, some scaffolding to support her students. Beautiful. I also know like in there, there was some like turn and talk, but she kind of kept it whole group. She also was repetitive in some of the questions she was asking to really like hit home an idea with those students. Now I want to ask you this question. Did she really teach this lesson with fidelity? So using the participants tab and the raise hand feature, I would love for one or two participants to share their thinking. And Gleason, go ahead and unmute. This isn't what I put in the chat, but I like that the teacher addressed the little boy that said one more, and she said, how many more? And and then he corrected himself and said one more, four. Yep. So she just kept that language consistent. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that was scripted in the lesson. No, it wasn't. But it meant she understood what was needed, right? And she had that deep understanding of the story and what was needed for her students to be successful. So in the moment, she can be very flexible to meet the needs of every kid um, that is there. So thank you. I still have this question. Did she teach the lesson with fidelity? I would love just one, maybe just one person to share. Christy, my reliable Christy. I just don't like the uncomfortable silences. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I feel like That's why I wait did. long. <laughs> I feel like she did just because looking at um, you know what we printed out. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know if she worked as a team with um, her other grade levels, but I mean, she's obviously like meeting the needs of her students, but she's still you know honoring the content that's in Eureka. Um, they're engaged and it seems like they're on a pretty good pace. Like it seems like this is kind of a built on a lesson that happened earlier and that she's building the foundation for the lesson coming next. Yeah, absolutely. So the main takeaway here is it is taught with fidelity, but she made changes. 
She supported her students. And so when you are using Eureka, trust your teacher expertise, trust your instincts, and make adjustments. Don't follow it as a script, right? The, the components are recommendations from experts who are really good at this stuff. But at the end of the day, you are also an expert and get to be autonomous to make those choices. So make them. All right. The next place that I'm going to take us is to the website because uh, you guys all have access to the digital suite. Maybe you have already been playing around in there, uh, but I want to just highlight a few components of the digital suite that I really personally love. So if you go to greatminds.org, it's going to take you to a page that is just like this. We want to go to math, because uh, we're teaching Eureka math. <laughs> and across the top, you're going to see um, a toolbar just like this. Um, I highly recommend checking out this webinar section. Um, there's actually a webinar about uh, preparing to teach and customizing, so you could do that as a follow-up. But there's additional really positive stuff in there. Um, so you can definitely go in there. The next place I'm going to take you is resources. And if you have not, this is how you will add the digital suite to your dashboard. So think of this kind of like Pinterest. If you've ever been on Pinterest, you have to find the file and save it to your resource dashboard um, to be able to use it. Um, but in here, you're going to see lots of good stuff. I want to click math um, just to make sure only math stuff comes up. Um, but you can see there's a digital suite, the basic curriculum files, print materials, uh, resource packs, parent tip sheets. If you have any Spanish speaking students, a lot of the translation stuff is in here. Um, and so you're going to find some really good stuff in there. Now, let's go to the digital suite. The digital suite has two parts. One is called Eureka Navigator and one is called Teach Eureka. Together, they make up the digital suite. I'm going to take us to Teach Eureka first. It is exactly what it sounds like. So you as a teacher who are developing your content knowledge and how to deliver components of these Eureka lessons that look very foreign to you, Teach Eureka are the writers who have videoed themselves and are explaining modules, are explaining lessons and topics. They're showing fluency activities. So they're teaching you how to teach the, the, the lessons, okay? So these videos um, are extremely helpful. I cannot recommend them enough. The next place is the navigator. Um, and the navigator is literally the entire curriculum in a digital format. I personally love using a navigator versus paper copies. Some people prefer paper, so make your choice. Um, you can see every module for every grade level. And within there, we can click in. So I'm going to go to my grade three example. And what you're going to see at this page is all of the resources that I've already talked through. Okay, so this part right here is that module uh, narrative that we saw. You're going to see um, that each topic is its own little box. And within each uh, topic, you can click either a standard or a lesson. So if I click into the lesson level, I'm going to see PDF versions of all the files. So this, if you're teaching in a remote world, you can download specific PDFs and attach them to whatever LMS you guys are using. The videos are also linked so you can watch. And then you're going to see um, the components broken down in this way. The one resource that I absolutely love in the Navigator is at the standard level. So if I'm teaching 3OA1, I'm going to click into the standard. Here, I can see where this standard is addressed in every single module, every lesson, and every fluency activity that coordinates to it. So if my kids are struggling or need additional remediation for this standard, this is a great place to go because it's going to provide you a wealth of activities or lessons or fluencies that you can pull and use to remediate with students. Similarly, the foundational standards are linked. So if my kids are struggling with this one, I'm going to click to a foundational standard. 
here are lessons and fluency activities that I might build into my current lessons to help uh, scaffold or allow students to be successful on my grade level content, okay? Questions about the digital suite. All right, you guys are making it a little easy on me, so we'll keep moving. Um, we're already at the end. So we've talked about those three key shifts. We've talked about that module overview. We talked all four components of the lesson. We briefly talked about assessments and briefly talked about how do you really customize and teach this curriculum with fidelity. What I'd like for you to do at this point is pause and think about what are your key takeaways? What are you really walking away with as your next step um, as you're preparing to teach this curriculum? Um, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about it while SEAL sets up our last breakout room of the day.